Tired of your smart home going offline when the internet goes down? Or maybe you are frustrated with the ever-increasing price and privacy risks of cloud-based services. In this video, I'll show you why self-hosting Home Assistant is the way to go to solve those frustrations. We'll explore the power of Zigbee and Z-Wave, ditch the cloud for local self-hosting control, and build a solid smart home system that's always there for you, even when the internet isn't. While Home Assistant is free and open source, the first thing you need to get started is a system to run Home Assistant on, such as a Raspberry Pi, that you can pick up from the sponsor of this video, Micro Center. Micro Center is a great place to get started with Raspberry Pi projects such as one in this video. From the Philips Hue lights that I use in my studio to laptops, desktops, gaming systems, and even full-on racing simulator builds, Micro Center has an amazing array of products and a helpful store staff to help you find it all. We thank them for sponsoring this video. I'm not going to spend too much time on the installation because it's relatively straightforward and easy. And there's already a ton of tutorials out there on how to get started with Home Assistant as far as the install. Even with a Raspberry Pi, it's part of the Raspberry Pi Imager. So you don't really have to even download anything if you have already loaded the Raspberry Pi Imager tool. If you aren't using a Raspberry Pi, they have guides for other devices, such as just a generic x86, Odroid, etc. But there's also the Home Assistant Green, which is a device you can purchase with Home Assistant pre-set up on it. And if you go down a little further, they also have a little bit more advanced, the Home Assistant Yellow, which requires a Raspberry Pi compute module. So there's plenty of options and their documentation is really outstanding. Now you'll find a link in the description below that will take you to this forum post on my Home Assistant notes. First, I have my Home Assistant's parts list. These are things I am using. They work perfectly fine with Home Assistant and I do keep that list up to date. This video is being made here in December of 2024, but I will be changing the list as I buy different devices. And if I find they work well, I'll throw them in the list. There is a great list of compatibility that you can find from Home Assistant, but there's always exceptions like it works, but not well. I will put only devices that I know work well because I want to share that with you, the audience. Next are channels I follow for Home Assistant. There's a lot of videos on Home Assistant and sometimes having a lot of videos or videos that are well SEOed because they're really popular or clickbaity get to the top. But the ones with the really technical and detailed information, as I know, can be really hard to get to a higher search result in YouTube. So some of these channels don't have a lot of subscribers, but they have a lot of great information. So I've curated these. And if you want to join my forums and join this discussion and let me know other ones that you found useful, hey, go ahead and do that and add them to the list here. The channels also, and not all of them, but a few of them have write-ups that accompany their videos, which I really appreciate. So it lets you get in there and copy and paste some things if needed. Speaking of that, Home Assistant Notes from Codemash. Codemash is an annual event I attend, and this was a great write-up all in GitHub of how to automate things. And there's a lot of other extras that are in there, such as how to use induction monitoring to track power usage on things that aren't necessarily smart, including ways to build automations around that. Very detailed write-ups on there. I have not gone as far as building it, but had a great discussion. And the GitHub is very detailed on how to get that set up. There's a lot you can spider off of from there to keep adding to the Home Assistant world. Zigbee or Z-Wave, why not both and what's the difference? Well, my answer is both. I like Zigbee and Z-Wave. I think these protocols are great. And I use a lot of my devices are mixed. Some are one, some are the other. You can use both of these perfectly fine. And Home Assistant, if you look in the parts list that I have, you'll see the particular dongle I use that supports both. I know that's an older dongle and there's new ones that may be better. I've had this for years and not had a problem. So I'm not recommending absolutely you buy the one I have. I'm saying it works for me and I'm not going to buy a new one because it's not broke, but you can find different devices to support these. Spend some time in the forums if you want something different than what I have. I can't recommend one because I'm just not an authority on which is the best one today because that was the best one I found recommended several years ago and it's been working for the last four years without a problem but when it comes to the protocol i did a little feature write up for people wondering what the difference between these two protocols are i've had people say well tom z is proprietary you really want to use a proprietary protocol not really but there's a lot of good z-wave devices out there and they work and zigbee or z-wave are both much better than wi-fi now let's talk about why i don't prefer wi-fi devices first is going to be cloud dependency Often, but not always, Wi-Fi devices are not local only and have some type of cloud dependency. I just don't really need cloud dependency. It kind of defeats the purpose of if the internet's not working, I want all my smart devices to still be able to be smart and self-hosted. Next is security. 
These devices are accessible over regular IP networks and may need internet access, which of course leads to potential security problems. And security really does feel like an afterthought if a thought at all on many of these devices. Next is compatibility. As you upgrade to newer versions of Wi-Fi, those older devices seem to have more and more issues connecting. Now, light switches are pretty simple. I just want the light to turn on and off, and I don't want to have to replace them because they're not compatible anymore. They're still a useful device, but compatibility problems frequently push you to buying newer devices. So you kind of avoid that because Zigbee and Z-Wave aren't changing very much because they don't need to. Power consumption. Wi-Fi is always going to use more power compared to Zigbee and Z-Wave and some of the other protocols. Not much of an issue when they're plugged in, but this is where you have limitations or where you can place them. I have some small water sensors that the batteries in them will last about two years. And that's because they're not using Wi-Fi. So they're able to sit in some small corner monitoring for a drip or a leak without me worrying about the Wi-Fi connectivity problems. And if you have something that goes offline or the battery dies and doesn't notify you of its purpose, well, that can be quite a problem. Now, I do know there's some other newer protocols such as Matter that have come out. I'm not really touching on those because I'm not using them right now, but there's plenty you can go read about them. The Zigbee and Z-Wave have been around for a long time, and I don't think they're going away anytime soon. Now, as I said, loading Home Assistant is relatively easy. The web interface that walks you through setting it up, not too difficult to use. It does drop you on a blank page, which can be a little bit daunting. So refer to some of those more in-depth videos that are all about getting started. My goal here is to show you what I have built with Home Assistant to give you ideas of where you can be with it. And maybe what I did is what you want to do. And oh, that's part of the reason I'm sharing because there's been a lot of questions because my studio automations, which if I click any of these, will do things like turn off the camera that I'm recording on right now. This is how I use Home Assistant for my functionality of my studio or even things like the wake on LAN option I have here for my computers. So I have that level of automation. I do want to take the time to mention that there's an app for this. So if you load this on iPhone or Android, your iPhone and Android can become part of this. And yes, the iPhone and Android apps can point to a self-hosted instance without using the cloud either. And when you're using the app, any changes you make to the dashboard are real time in the app on the phone as well. The phones become part of the Home Assistant network because you can pull sensor information from the phone if you want to something you have to authorize in the app. But I think that's really cool. It also gives you the ability to have notifications on the phone. I use this option so I can use the phone app before I turn my computer on to, well, use Wake on LAN to turn my computers on and shut things off. This is one of the reasons I like it being on a Raspberry Pi so it's independent from anything else on my network. I can shut off the computers and then use the Wake on LAN function to turn them back on. Now, before I talk about the dashboard and how I'm using Home Assistant, I want to mention the integrations. There's a lot of them. And if you look at the device and services and integrations, here are things that discovered that I'm not using, such as I don't feel like setting the printer up at Home Assistant, but I guess there's an option for that. But I do have other integrations, such as Ecobee, such as the mobile app integrations, or even the network monitoring tool to monitor my UPS, the Synology integrations, Simply Safe Home Security, Zigbee automations, Z-Wave automations, and I was playing a little bit with the OpenAI. API so you can have it query things in OpenAI. There's actually a massive amount of integrations that you can do, and this does include a lot of things that are cloud services. So even though it works locally with all these devices, you can reach out to the cloud with different APIs to have it talk to those services. Obviously, when you lose internet, you won't be able to talk to those services, but your lights will still work, and that's an important feature. Also, I like having the ability to talk to both of these devices because they give you a lot of extended functionality because my alarm system, I don't mind paying a subscription for because I've got fire and police monitoring on there in case anything happens. But when you come all the way over here back to the dashboard and we go over to the sensor stats, it actually has my smoke detectors in here. Or if we look at my Synology integration we have here where I've told to pull my Synology surveillance station cameras and pull all the feeds into one page so I can do everything inside a home assistant without opening up the Synology app, it can also show me the lock and alarm status or even click here and I can arm my alarm. One of the things Home Assistant really becomes as you build these integrations is the center of all things. Instead of having to go to the Alarm app or the Synology app, which I can still go to each of these individually, by pulling everything into Home Assistant, it becomes my central place where all things can be managed. I can get the status of all these different sensors. I even have these sensors such as the water leak sensors or the kitchen sensors, laundry room, smoke detectors, 
home temperature humidity, and that's actually facilitated through an Ecobee system. And I can even adjust the settings or choose the presets that are in here. Mode heat, preset morning is what it's on right now. And this interaction means I don't even have to open up the Ecobee app and all that data is right here. But we come back to the dashboard here to talk about what I'm automating. And maybe I'll do a future video on the Synology integration because I've talked before and I use a Synology surveillance station with the Amcrest object recognition cameras, and the Synology surveillance station actually is pulling web hooks. So if it's a motion detection, it doesn't turn my lights on, but if it recognizes a person or a car in the driveway, or if a threshold is reached where a package may be on there, you can trigger an automation in Home Assistant to let you know something's on the porch or let you know a car's in a driveway or let you know if a person's in a driveway. And each one of these notifications can be customized and set up inside of Home Assistant through the automation process that you find under settings, automations, and scenes. Now here's a list of the automations that I have, but let's talk about how they get created. I really like the simple language they use so you don't have to be a programmer to build automations. It starts with when. A trigger is a specific event happening in or around your home. For example, when the sun sets, any trigger listed here will start your automation. So you have a lot of options from devices, entities, time and location, or other trigger options. And if maybe you have a condition you want met, so we start with the trigger, we want this condition met, then do, and then do can be turn on a light or send a notification. So let's take a look at one of the ones I have. Go ahead and leave this and look at the moisture detection one. I actually have the when, the trigger, being several different options. It's any of these sensors having moisture on them. I could build individual automations, but anytime there's moisture, I'm concerned. And if I don't really have any extra conditions that need to be met, but then do perform action, send notification. It sends a notification. It tells me to check the dashboard and it says, yo, something is moist. This pops up on our phones. The reason I have it say, yo, something is moist is because in Android, that's actually what shows up as the title. It actually gives you a notice and an error inside of the Home Assistant too, if you happen to have it open. But saying that to my phone would raise concern. And then if you click on it, it lets me know to check the sensor dashboard. That's the message I get. And because I can see the sensor dashboard on my phone, I can then go over to the overview, look at the sensors, and it will let me know if any of these have detected a leak. Right now they all say dry. Now let's talk about the dashboard. There's a little pen icon at the top and this allows you to edit the dashboard or create new extra dashboards like this one I have for Synology, this one I have for my wife, and this one I have for the sensor stats. Also, there's granular permission controls in here. If I edit this particular dashboard and I look at visibility, me and Cass can both see this. But if we go to my dashboard and we edit, when we look at visibility, I have it turned off so she cannot. She also doesn't have edit permissions as a user. So this does have support for user controls and what they see in a view. She doesn't really need to see anything on my dashboard here because if she were to accidentally turn something off, then that would cause me a big problem, especially if I was in the middle of recording. Clicking the add card here down at the bottom brings up this and it lets you add a block essentially that is pre-filled out that you can customize. Or you can do this by entity. If I wanted to find something, let's say from my Synology, these are things that are already adopted into the system. I can click this, maybe I'll click this, hit continue. It'll start adding this information right here and I can click add to the dashboard and I'll have a new card. Editing any of these cards, there's an edit button at the bottom and it lets you customize these. And you may notice that it has the entity name, but that isn't what it's called right here. We can edit these to give them a friendly name like lamp versus Phillips 929, etc. light. Then you can customize the icon for each one. We're going to click cancel because you can view all of this as code. Matter of fact, if we went up here to the top, we can do raw code configuration for all of this. If we wanted to view the code or customize it in some unique way that the visual editor doesn't let us do, but we can also do this to any individual card. So if we go here, we show code editor, you can see it's all the same code and I can edit these and see visually how it's going to look when I hit save. This also makes it easy to copy and paste if I wanted to duplicate this on another tab with another card without having to redo the visual way and add each one back to make that card match. There's even visibility options for any of the cards to say under these conditions, make this visible or not visible based on certain conditions and settings. It's a really customizable system. This is where Home Assistant can be very overwhelming 
overwhelming for people figuring out how you want to customize it. But that's also why I'm showing the simplicity of how I did mine, or at least to me, what I think is simple to get the basics done. Now, what happens if Home Assistant dies or is inaccessible? Do all my smart devices become dumb devices or stuck devices. And I don't mind them being just dumb devices, but stuck devices would be a pain. That's one of the reasons I choose the hardware I do, such as these zoos units. This little button will turn them on or off. Now, if Home Assistant is on and I press the button, it will actually toggle inside of Home Assistant because it recognizes through the Z-Wave connection the position it's in, even if you set it and not Home Assistant. So these will work perfectly fine if Home Assistant is rebooting, turned off, etc. And I have no problem with the light switches I chose either. These are the in Brighton switches. I put these in my walls and just press the button up or down. It looks like a normal light switch, so most people wouldn't realize it's a smart switch. And you don't have to know anything about my smart home to turn lights on or off. I don't like things that are tied to Home Assistant that can get stuck. So I'm trying to be careful when I choose hardware. So in the event something goes wrong with Home Assistant because it's electronic and inevitably things break or things go wrong, I'm still able to do basic functions like turn the lights on so I can figure out what's going on. Now, a popular feature for Home Assistant is building automation via presence detection. It's been on my to-do list, but I haven't really gotten around to it. I usually just turn things on and off of my phone. And I also have this. This is a little Zigbee button. I think these are really cool because they allow you to build automations based on pressing this button. You can put these around the house. They got a little sticky back you can put on there. They last a long time. You can get over a year plus out of any one little coin battery in these. And what this does is one press does one thing. A long press can do another thing. And I have it just set to turn things off. So if I press it once, it'll turn this bench light off where I'm sitting. If I hold it a little longer, it'll just power down my whole studio. I think this is one of those handy little things that I find really convenient. Maybe you will too, because just by holding this, I can just power everything off. So we'll just do this. There we powered off that. And now we'll power off this. Now I'm in the dark. Now, something I didn't touch on was voice activation. Yes, it's supported, but no, I'm not interested in it, but there's plenty of people who have covered this. Now, I don't like talking to the computer to tell it to do something. It just doesn't seem like the best way to communicate with a system. I prefer just tapping a button on my phone, tapping that little button I shown, or just setting up an automation based on time of day. But eventually I'll probably put some presence detections in so I can walk into my office and have certain things happen. Maybe that's a future video. I don't know how many videos I'll do on Home Assistant. I mostly wanted to share how I use Home Assistant, give you an idea of how you can use Home Assistant, and give you the resources to really dive deep into it to, well, build the ultimate self-hosted home automation system. Now, let me know in the comments down below what you think of Home Assistant. Like and subscribe to see more content from the channel. Head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com to have a more in-depth discussion about this particular topic or many others, especially because that's where the resources are that I linked to earlier in the video. And hit me up on the socials, whatever socials you can find me on at lawrencesystems.com. All right, and thanks.